Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Friday, July 31st, 2020, and today we're going to be talking about the 2008 election. Pretty much we're going to be going through uh, what's expected of the Democrats in 2020 and how 12 years later they are expected to make the most gains uh, in the United States Senate and on the presidential map than they did back in 2008. So essentially, since 2008, that was pretty much the Democrats' high point. They were never really expected to perform better of that. Whether it was a midterm election, including 2018, or a presidential election, the Democrats really were never expecting to gain that many seats, nor were they projected to by many people in the mainstream media and the political forecasters. So on your screen right now, you're looking at the generic ballot, and the reason why I want to bring this up is because we are talking about the same 2018 electorate. In the same year that the Democratic Party won the national popular vote by 9%, according to the House of Representatives results, and there are races everywhere, obviously, um, the Democratic Party was able to pick up over 35 seats, and I think 35 was the highest end for the Democratic Party based off model projections. Nobody expected them to gain more than that, and they did. So in 2018, the Democratic Party won back the House of Representatives, and yes, they did lose the United States Senate. They lost two seats in the Senate. Uh, it went from a 51 to 49 Republican majority, expanding it to 53 to 47. But if you look at some of those Senate races, they would not have been winnable for Democrats if they did not have this type of energy. Now they're entering into the November election with around the same margin that they've held the entire campaign campaign season. The Democrats have had an eight-point average, which coincidentally is the same eight-point average that the Democrats had entering into 2018 that ended up with them winning by 9%. So if we talk about the House, let's talk about the House before we actually get into the Senate. The House of Representatives is not competitive. The Democratic Party, according to the JHK forecast, has roughly a 98% chance at retaining their majority in the United States House, 235 seats on average and 200 seats for the GOP. That's important to note because the House of Representatives is the same exact congressional districts with the exception of a few states that were forced to redistrict that was the Democratic Party was working with in 2010, 2012, not 2010, 2012, 2014, uh, you know, 2016, and obviously 2018. So since this map was drawn back in 2010, the Democratic Party was never in the majority, and now they are absolutely going to retain it. So if we look back, let's go ahead and take a look at the 2018 House of Representatives elections. In 2018, the Democratic Party gained 21 House seats. Now, the reason why they gained so many House seats and already had an advantage over the GOP is because they had long-term Democrat incumbents and a number number of uh, states that are considered to be safe GOP strongholds. If you look across the South, the Democrats were dominating here. If you look at North and South Dakota, there were popular Democrat incumbents that were in these races. If you look across the country, the Democratic Party didn't actually have as strong of a hold in states such as California um, and some parts of the Northeast that they do right now. A lot of their majority was relying on conservative Democrats from the South that have since mostly been expelled from the United States Senate by those Republican voters. Fast Fast forward to 2016 and you take a look at that map, a lot more red nationwide compared to 2008. So you're looking at the difference. What eight years can do to an election? That that much red was added onto the map. So this is the time in which the uh, Republican Party was in the majority. But if you look at 2018, the Democratic Party dominated nationwide on terms of the popular vote and in a number of these districts. Now, here's the thing. If you look at this map, it doesn't look too much different from the 2016 map. But if you look at the amount of pickups for the Democratic Party, 41 net gains. So that's pretty substantial. We're looking at uh, a House of Representatives map that doesn't look as blue as the 2008 map, yet roughly would mimic what we saw in 2006, which I think is a better representation of what the House of Representatives looks like now in terms of its uh, overall party composition. Uh, maybe not in terms of where the seats are coming from, but uh, based off the numbers alone, the Democratic Party... They're winning by winning in center, uh, centralized districts, districts around in suburban areas, around cities that uh, were previously Republican strongholds that have since, in terms of party registration and in terms of anti-Trump vote, have moved over to the Democratic Party. So the Democratic Party is at a pretty good point entering in 2020 in the House of Representatives. Don't expect them to gain too many seats. They probably will gain seats considering that even in 2016 and 2012 in presidential election years, regardless of Obama winning in 2012 and Clinton losing in 2016, the Democrats gained roughly the same amount of seats in the United States House of Representatives. So moving past the United States House, let's talk about the Senate. The Senate is important as well. The presidential election is probably the last thing we'll talk about. But the Senate, the Democratic Party in 2012, let's go ahead and take a look at how they performed um, in, in those Senate elections. In 2012, let's go ahead and see if I can find it, actually. In 2012, the Democrats gained two seats. This is actually the same 2018 map. So it's funny that the numbers uh, have pretty much flipped. There were 53 Democratic seats, if you don't count the two independents, and 45 Republican seats. And now the Democrats have 
47 and the Democrats have 50 uh, the Republicans have 53 but the Democrats only gained two seats here they also did suffer extraordinary losses in both 2010 which wasn't enough to flip the majority but then you go to 2014 keep in mind the Democrats at one point in time had nearly 60 seats I think for a couple of weeks they had 60 seats but uh, looking at 2014 the Democrats lost nine seats and the GOP made a net gain of nine, 54 to 46 in the Senate. 2016 comes around despite Hillary Clinton losing, the Democrats gained two seats in the United States Senate. And then in 2018, with a map that is super unfavorable, the Democrats end up only losing two seats. Um, I know they probably could have done better, but if you look at the seats that flipped, Missouri, Indiana, North Dakota, and Florida, all Trump states from 2016. And the only one that was competitive in 2016 was Florida. And uh, I don't think I have to remind people that that margin was less than 1% in 2018. So the 2018 Senate elections, the Democrats didn't do well then. 2020 is the Democratic Party's time to shine. They have a number of competitive races that they're currently leading in. They're leading in Arizona. Without a doubt, they will carry Arizona and Colorado. Um, those are two seats with Republican incumbents. The Democrats are also maintaining their leads in Democratic uh, incumbent seats, states such as New Mexico and uh, Michigan and Minnesota and New Hampshire states that probably won't be competitive for a while, and Virginia. The Democrats are also expected to pick up North Carolina and Maine, and they are competitive in other key uh, Republican states. They are competitive in Kansas. They are competitive in Montana. They are competitive in Iowa. They are competitive in both Georgia elections. Um, if we're looking at the races nationwide, the Democratic Party has realistic shots at a lot of the Senate races. 11 out of the 12 toss-up races that I characterize have Republican incumbents. So if we're looking at the nationwide uh, Senate composition, the Democrats Democratic Party is poised to gain possibly five seats, which would be the biggest gain for the Democrats since the 2008 Senate elections, um, which obviously coincided with President Barack Obama's victory. Now, the reason why it's important to note that it was President Obama's victory is because he had nearly, actually at the time, I would still consider this to be a landslide victory. He had nearly 200 more electoral votes over John McCain. He was able to flip states, as, states such as Indiana and Ohio and North Carolina and Florida, states that uh, went to Bush in 2004. Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, Nebraska's second district. These states were all, uh, you know, Bush states four years prior to this election. So when Obama flipped these states, it was pretty substantial. And he also had a lot of energy on his side, the same type of energy we're seeing for the Democrats now. In fact, the generic ballot is almost mimicking what we saw in 2008. Not to mention the issues that were important to a lot of Americans in 2008 are very important now. The American electorate is boring. We don't change. We only care about the economy. We only care about health care. And now we care about the coronavirus, which can be tied into medical services. And then, of course, uh, not necessarily civil rights. I think that's a little too extreme, but um, equal protection under the law, the Black Lives Matter movement are now top things that may not have been too important for voters in 2008, but it was definitely monumental for, uh, you know, African-American people in America, minorities in America, to have the first minority president elected in 2008. And that's why Obama trounced John McCain amongst every single demographic group except for white voters and still went over a lot of white voters, maybe not white men, but decimated him amongst white women. And Hillary Clinton did well in 2016. I will say that she did well amongst white women, but she didn't do as well in terms of driving up the numbers. The margins were roughly similar to 2012, but the turnout numbers were not by any means. Black turnout dropped 7%. 2012 was the first time that black turnout was higher than white turnout. Then it dropped down 7% in 2016. And white turnout, guess what? Increased. The Democratic Party saw a decrease in terms of their demographic groups turning out, and Donald Trump saw an increase in terms of his groups coming out to vote. Now, if we look at where the 2020 election stands now, the Democratic Party is on track to win. They are on track to completely flip what we saw just four years ago. We're looking at a number of Rust Belt states and a number of swing states that were previously Trump states four years ago that may have been Obama states, but may not have been, uh, may possibly were also Romney states, for example, North Carolina and Texas and Georgia that are absolutely competitive for this election. The Democratic Party could likely ride a wave larger than the 2012 or possibly even 2008 presidential win. The reason why I'm not mentioning President Bush's approval rating is because he was not the incumbent. Republicans and Democrats probably didn't care too much about Bush's performance, comparing it to John McCain. John McCain distanced himself throughout the entire campaign away from Bush. And then if you look at the polling numbers at a time, McCain was leading. And this was around June, July. So during that time period, it was very likely or not likely, but it was very possible for the Republican Party to actually win that presidential race. A lot of things had to go wrong, which did go wrong for the McCain campaign. And I wouldn't say you could put that all on President Bush. But now we have a very unpopular incumbent, President Trump, who never experienced a positive approach 
approval rating except for January in 2017, who now hovers around 55% in terms of disapprove and 41% in terms of approve, an overall net negative of 14%. Yeah, the Democratic Party is going to do well in this election. They're poised to retain the United States House of Representatives, without a doubt. It looks like they're the favorites to win the United States Senate. Not to mention, they could likely get closer depending on who wins on August 4th in Kansas. They could get closer depending on who wins the Junkle primary in Georgia's Senate election. They could get closer if more money is fundraised for Montana. If states such as Iowa narrow up even more, Georgia's regular election narrows up even more. If Tommy Tuberville experiences some type of, uh, you know, scandal, I wouldn't put it past the GOP to have not correctly vetted their candidates. They've done it in the past, especially in elections following 2016. If we look, a lot of those House of Representatives members that are facing tough re-election bids, it's because they were indicted. If we look a lot of, at a lot of the candidates who have lost in previous races, it's because scandals have come out about them. And the GOP seems to be one of the, the party that has the most scandals, whether it's with President Trump. I think Hillary Clinton was probably one of the only notable Democratic nominees that had a lot of baggage in a, at least modern political history. For Donald Trump, he didn't have any prior to 2016. He had never held political office. He had never served in the United States military. He pretty much had nothing to his name other than his billion dollar fortune, which obviously a lot of Americans liked. And that's why he was elected back in 2016. But now he has a pandemic, a global pandemic at that on top of him that is expected to reach 230,000 deaths by the time we reach November. And then we also have to worry about race relations. Can you believe that? The last time that was a top issue was 1964. So when we look at race relations and we talk about that, America must be in a really bad state if race relations is amongst the top three issues that voters are looking for when they cast their ballots. We're looking at increased turnout, increased turnout amongst minority voters. We're looking at increased Democratic support from senior citizens, a, a, a demographic group that voted for Trump by 15% in 2016, that Biden now leads by 5%. This is a pretty substantial portion of the electorate, not to mention Joe Biden is running up the numbers in terms of uh, white college educated voters compared to a single digit victory for Hillary Clinton that is now well over 20%. For Joe Biden. So he's dominating amongst key demographic groups that could land him a victory. There's a reason why he has an 80% chance of winning Wisconsin. There's a reason why he has a 93% chance of winning Michigan. There's a reason why Trump withdrew his ads from Michigan. There's a reason why Pennsylvania is at 90% for Joe Biden, despite Trump carrying these states. And it's not just these three. North Carolina is expected to go to Biden. Florida is expected to go to Biden. Arizona is expected to go to Joe Biden. Iowa is expected to go to Joe Biden. Iowa is super notable because President Trump won here by nearly 10% just four years ago. Can you imagine that amount of swing? That's comparable to Maine's second district from 2012 to 2016, and it is likely to happen nationwide. So right now, not only is Trump's approval rating dwindling, the Democrats are leading in the generic ballot. If we take a look at the nationwide uh, uh, national numbers, Joe Biden is dominating uh, Donald Trump in the state and in, in the nationwide numbers, 8%. So if we're looking here, the Democratic Party is absolutely on track to win the United States Senate, to retain the House of Representatives, and absolutely win the presidential election as it stands today, which could be the biggest gains amongst the Senate and also retaining the House and the presidential uh, net difference between the electoral votes since 2008. Absolutely. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. There is also a Discord link on your screen that you can go ahead and uh, type into your browser. It'll bring you to the Discord invite. You can go ahead and join that server. I think we're uh, around 150 members. On your screen, there is a video you can go ahead and watch and then a playlist for my 2020 election predictions. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all tomorrow.